working this time. And um, I really, I think I'm only here to say that um, in case anyone has any questions for me, I have office hours this afternoon as usual, um, but really this is a help session for, for you and for them. So um, I'm gonna stay logged into this Zoom call because it's recording locally on my computer. I don't have cloud recording, um, but I'm gonna be multitasking in the background. So if anyone has any questions for me personally, um, ask me now, because otherwise I will, uh, I'll just be checking in occasionally on this Zoom call. Um, so mm. other than that, I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Canfield. Okay. Well, it's good to see all of your little black boxes again. <laughs> um, I would like to open the floor, first of all, for questions, because we're primarily here for questions this morning. And I think we should talk about that um, and kind of get the meeting going with a discussion or input from you guys. I hope you've had time to look at the lab write up and look at your data and uh, let me know if you found problems or issues or um, <clears throat> or if you're making progress and have gotten some question into the data that you would like to discuss. Um, I do not necessarily plan to uh, sit here uh, talking like a radio announcer um, off the cuff. I do have a couple of presentations that I thought I would squeeze in around the questions or perhaps even to stimulate questions. So I'll stop talking. And if somebody has a question they want to start with, um, what is it? You raise a hand or shout it out or something like that. You might have to shout it out. I'm not sure I have any host control here. Uh, I think it would be beneficial maybe if you started like with those little slides that you had just to start brainstorming possibly off of those things too. We can kind of build okay. off that if anything. So, so what you're telling me is you're you're at your computer, but you haven't really started yet. <laughs> okay. I, I understand that. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me see. I've got the directory up. I will try to share screen. And it would be this one. Okay. All right. Okay. I'm being told that you guys can see my screen. Is that is that the case? Uh, everybody can see the screen? Yep. Yeah, okay. we can see it. Good. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, we'll back off a bit. I have Zoom screens interfering because I'm pushing the mouse around. Okay, um, two review slides to begin with. The first one is, it's a little bit um, outdated. I didn't take the time to update it this year. There were so many changes. Um, this is a summary of uh, all the files that you should have in your folders. Um, you have seven overlays and you have 10 information chromatograms. And historically, you've, you would have gotten six tables. But this year, I'm pretty sure I just gave you four tables. I didn't, I dropped the um, spectrum points table. That had not ever proved to be particularly useful for students. We did talk about it in the first lecture. And I also dropped the special analysis results table pulled out by itself. Um, the analysis results are now in the same table as the total results. Um, <clears throat> so, um, you'll have just those tables. Um, and then um, in the information chromatograms, the 
um, numbers are different. Uh, the numbers on the left here for the file names are the old numbers. Uh, you're going to have newer numbers, particularly for the lower uh, <clears throat> items in the list. So this is just a summary to help you see everything that you should have in your directories table. This table kind of is a summary of the screenshot table I showed last week of the contents of a folder from one of the teams. Okay, <clears throat> this also is an older results table from a couple of years ago. Um, and I have highlighted some points to remind you again that you will get from one injection of a blank, you will get two chromatograms because we are taking 3D data and I have asked the, the instrument to give us the 240 nanometer chromatogram and the 210 nanometer chromatogram. With the vitamin C and eluent, because that is the base chromatogram from which you are doing so much work and making so many comparisons, um, there are three chromatograms that come out of it, the 240 nanometer working wavelength, the 210 nanometer, so we can see how the background looks at lower wavelength, and 243, which is not, still not exactly at the maximum, but pretty close to the maximum, uh, so that you can do comparisons on these three chromatograms and see what the differences are. Then we have uh, two vitamin C and sugar. They're also at 240 and 210. And then there's your fruit juice at 240 and 210. And then in this particular one, um, there's also, I included the wavelength change because that is a single injection and we get 240 and 254 nanometer chromatograms. Now, let me ask you some questions here to begin with. Um, why did we choose 210 nanometers? Or for that matter, why did we even choose to get chromatograms at a wavelength other than 240? Anybody can chime in on this. I'll try to look around and see if I see hands, but it's a little tricky because I've got my screen pretty full here. Okay. So um, anybody want to discuss why we are taking data at 210 nanometers? Okay, let me put it to you this way. How about we turn it around, okay? Um, and let's pretend that you guys have asked me that question, okay? So does somebody want to say, would you please discuss why we are using 210 nanometers? I'm pushing for discussion, guys. I, I need to hear some voices or um, something here. Could you please explain why it's not at 240? Well, it is at 240, but it's also at 210. See, that's the point. We, we have chosen two wavelengths. It's not uh, either or, it's a both and. Okay. And we have chosen 210 because we want to try to see what we can see at lower wavelength, which is where more compounds are going to have a response. As you get farther down towards the UV cutoff of 200, um, you can see more um, kinds of molecules. You can begin to pick up um, electron withdrawing double bond uh, compounds. You can pick up the carbonyl compounds, which in this case would be 
um, any juices, uh, acids that are in there, um, or just you can even begin to see slightly, not so much from um, actual UV absorption, but you can begin to see um, odd things like re whether or not there's any sugar present, whether or not there's any salts present. What just other th because the base the baseline is more easily disturbed at those lower wavelengths. So I chose 210 because it's not too close to cut off. Generally, the real limit, we almost never do any detecting below 205. Um, that's about the best you can hope for in water unless you've done some really special preparation um, or you have a very high concentration of something. So um, that is the main reason that we're also looking at 210. Okay. Um, and then with the wavelength change, anybody have any idea why I chose 254? I'll take a wild guess. Um, maybe because it's really above the cutoff, so you'll see less of the salt or sugar or um, nuance materials like before. That's good thinking, Sydney. Um, the the uh, there's there's more there's more to it than that, but that's a pretty good starting point uh, for a student coming in for the first time. Uh, it is good that you realize that as we go to higher wavelengths, usually we have less interference. So if we could really be working at two eighty, you know, it's you don't run into too many complications in the baseline of the wavelength up there. Um, it's also on the, the high wavelength side, well, the high energy, it's the low wavelength, but the high energy side of the aromatic region, which runs from about 250 to 280, 285, something like that. Um, the actual reason is a little bit, um, it's, it's history. Um, in the early days, the only detector lamps that could be um, used for UV detection, you know, below the visible, like below 350, uh, was the mercury line. And the mercury line is at 254. So mercury lamps were often used in a lot of equipment uh, as you could just use that one wavelength in the UV, um, there was nothing else available. So I primarily chose 254 for historical reasons, but you will note that like 210, um, it's on the down, way down low on the UV curve for a vitamin C. Vitamin C with its maximum at 243, is is uh, that's the high point, and it goes down on both sides. Two fifty four, it's beginning to get down to some extent, and it's also the beginning of the Matic region. So um, we have we have uh, we. <clears throat> sorry, I got a, a small interruption here. Okay, um, I'm. Um, I'm, I'm going to push on now to the next slide, I think, if you guys don't have any, any uh, follow-up here. Um, so here is um, the next slide. Um, I was hoping that perhaps um, one of you guys might ask this question. Um, on a spectrum index plot, why is there no absorbance scale shown? So let's look at a slide. And this is a fruit juice from two years ago. And um, do any of you want to discuss 
why there might not be a scale shown uh, for the spectra on the spectrum index plot. And I would remind you that we did talk about this in the first lecture. But it's, it's important that you understand it. Any ideas? Any comments? Okay, how about we look at it this way? <clears throat> the chromatogram shows several peaks, um, four big ones above two and a half minutes. Okay. And at this point, I think you're quite familiar with the vitamin C peak and the vitamin C spectrum. Okay. And that is um, on the fruit juice. So we don't exactly know what the concentration is, but it's um, 40 milliabsorbents. So we know that that is, mm, you know, somewhere around, um, well, pretty low concentration actually um, currently. But, uh, but the thing is it's several PPM. And we have the 243.6, and we know that for that particular spectrum, the peak is pretty close to 0 0.040 absorbers. Okay. Now, if we look at peak nine, which is right next to vitamin C, the spectrum uh, shows a lambda max at 214. But at 240, it doesn't show much at all. Okay. Um, it is uh, much, much reduced, um, not quite down on the flat part of the curve. That's about 260, but it's pretty low here, probably someplace in this area. I think you guys can see my mouse. So um, we know that that point is going to be about 0.038 or something like that, okay? So we have one spectrum that has 0.04 at the max and another peak that we know is about point, close to 0.04, but that's way down here on the curve. So it's obvious that these spectra are plotted on different scales. And remember, I told you that the data was auto-scaled so that it makes the, the biggest peak is close to the very top of the plot. And other things are scaled for that. So they don't have a scale because there'd have to be a scale for every spectrum. And there are eight of them here, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah. Um, and so, the, and they're all different and it would take up space. So they just let that go. And the uh, spectra are just shown to you qualitatively. Uh, but I did show you in the first lecture that you actually can have the instrument give you the spectrum. And you can have it give you the spectrum for each peak at any uh, time or point on that peak. Of course, at this point, that's more elaborate than you guys really need to know about right now in your understanding of chromatography. But I really want you to begin to appreciate how to read the data because we've got, um, we've got a lot of information displayed and you're going to have to go through your data and make sense of it. And it's not that hard to make sense of it. It's all right here given to you. Plus, remember, if there are questions, you can send me an email, you can come and see me, et cetera. Uh, we could set up uh, some kind of Zoom office hours or whatever. But please keep these things in mind and, and please think about what this is all, all means and what's going on here. 
So here, you know, this happens to be juice, and you know at this point, and it happens to be juice at 210. But if we had run the chromatogram at 240, you would see almost nothing from here back to the beginning. Now, another question I would bring up, just to get you to, you know, think about it a little bit. <clears throat> there is a peak three named and given a retention time, but that peak is negative. Okay, here's the question. Does the data tell us whether or not that peak is real? And by real, I mean, is it a molecular entity? Or is it just something going on in the solution as it goes through the detector at that point? Okay, now, <clears throat> if we look at peak three, what does the spectrum look like? Okay. The spectrum really almost looks like it's inverted too. Well, that doesn't make sense because if you had a molecular entity, you'd have to have a positive absorbance. So what we're looking at with this particular negative peak, because negative peaks are possible if you happen to have something that has a lower detector um, indication than, the, than your baseline is, then you actually can get negative peaks. It's not going to happen in the ultraviolet world, but it does happen in the conductivity world, and it does happen in the electrochemical world. So there are detectors where uh, negative peaks are real peaks and are actually used for analysis. Okay, so then where does this come from? Why do we have this funny uh, behavior at the beginning of the chromatogram? And that's a good, a good point, a, a good point to pay attention to. Remember, this is the juice. This is a juice chromatogram, and juice has sugars in it. And sugars disturb the baseline. And you get these refractive index rolling changes that go through the detector. And you'll have positive and negative excursions of the signal line because of that. So since we have this peak one, peak two combination, I think that we're probably looking at the sugar coming off and something else along with the sugar. I don't know exactly what. Uh, but something, the spectra for peaks one and two really just show that the uh, absorbance just goes chugging along until it shoots up to cutoff. And there's no particular sign of any um, obvious activity. And it's also pretty, uh, it appears to be um, of low concentration. So uh, I think I'll probably stop talking on this slide at this point. Has my discussion stimulated any questions? Yeah, I have a quick question. Okay. So in regards to what you're saying, say like for peak one and two, they're low concentration and they're like very, very close. Um, like, And then if you compare like peak one and two to peak four, like there's a clear difference. Would you be able to like say possibly that peak one or two are possibly the same thing or no. just the machine it's is unlikely. just so accurate it's two different it's things it's unlikely that they're the same thing because uh there is the beginning of separation okay so it's trust the machine basically well not absolutely okay <laughs> things go wrong okay uh i'm i'm just giving i'm trying to give you some guidelines so to give your brain some material to work with so that when you look at data you you work on getting information from the data okay um peak four uh there does appear to be a reasonable amount of it um, at 210, uh, we're not exactly sure what because we don't have a standard, so we don't know what the response factor is. The response factor is like the molar absorptivity of the molecule. So, you know, those change all the time. So we can't really say anything about how much is there. But if we look at peak four, do you get the impression that it's a single peak? I would. Why? Because there's really no like fray off. It's just 
it's a, it's a pretty I would say mediumly concentrated peak with. No, don't think about concentration. Do you think it's a single component? Yeah. Why? Because I just see a single peak raising. Ah, but does it have good peak shape? I would say about 90%. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Don't you see this big shoulder here under the 814? Here, let me help you. Oh, okay, yeah, that helps. Yeah, it's a little rounded off. Uh huh. All right. Yeah. It's more than it's it's a real yeah shoulder. yeah compared to like peak nine which is really more straight. Well, uh, Gaussian, you want okay, uh, peak eight is a pretty good example, or vitamin C itself. Although right now, uh, peak nine and vitamin C are so close to each other that we don't have baseline resolution. You know, baseline resolution is when that goes all the way down to the baseline. So that's what we call a good, clean, complete molecular separation. So yeah, peak eight is most likely a single component. Uh, peak nine and of course the vitamin C look like single components, but there's something else in peak four. And, and we could find that out if I was to do that. Uh, just you remember the point in the lecture where I took a point on the peak here and then at the peak and then over here at the inflection points and compared the spectra. And if they don't all match, it's not pure. Well, I'm pretty sure this won't match. Now, how could we begin to separate this peak out more? What do we need to change to get this, uh, this shoulder to separate or to get peak nine and vitamin C to separate better? Have you done enough reading to have ideas on what you might want to do to improve what is known as chromatographic resolution? Adjusting the flow rate. Adjusting the flow rate is one option and it could help. Um, do you have another idea for something that would help more? Maybe um, a longer column. Very good. That was the answer I was most looking for. There is yet another approach to be taken. Anybody want to guess what that might be? Okay, we would try a different column uh, with because different columns have different selectivity. So we might be able to find something that sees this component and this component uh, diff sufficiently differently that um, they are much more readily resolved. So in terms of uh, things to try, uh, changing the column length is a good thing to try first if you uh, can afford the time, because if you make the column longer, of course, it's going to take longer for each injection. Um, and then um, changing the flow rate, as was first suggested, uh, will give you some idea as to what you what you might be able to work with within the same eluent system. And then if those two things don't make you happy, it's probably time to try a completely different column and see what you can do there in terms of improving resolution. All right. Very good. So we've got some discussion beginning here. So I'm going to take this back down a bit. And then the next slide is just the table that goes with the juice, which we don't particularly need to pay attention to today. And then um, move on. OK, now at this point, do you guys want to ask some questions before I keep going with this part of the presentation? No. Okay. All right. So I will push on. Mm -hmm. What's going on with the void time discrepancy? Um, it's possible that you haven't even noticed that you have a void time discrepancy, but you will. 
and what is the void time discrepancy. What you're going to find when you start working through the write-up is that you have a measured void time from the hydrogen peroxide, and that number will not match the number you got when you used the formula. And the formula we might think of as a rough um, theoretical calculation of um, what the void time would be expected to be for this column. And um, I wanted to discuss with you how that comes about. So um, let me make the picture smaller. So here, I think I've almost got it all on scale. Not quite, I'll go down one more. Or even one more because you can't see the injector. Okay, there we go. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I have opened some doors on the front of the instrument. And when you do that, you can see the column compartment, which is the section right in the middle with the column in it. And what we're looking at here is the plumbing situation from the injector, which is this guy right down here is the um, six position injector, okay? And coming out of the injector is this red tubing that goes around, comes up and into the column. Okay. And then on the column, first of all, we don't go straight into the column. We go straight into this unit here, which is called the guard cartridge. And the guard cartridge has a small guard column or guard filter in it uh, that's made of the same material as the packing material in the column. And this will serve as a final filter and as a catcher of chromatographic junk. That is those compounds that really, really stick to the C18 stationary phase. And then it will allow the um, aqueous eluent and vitamin C to move on to the column for proper uh, chromatography. Then we have the column itself, which goes just about from this little white clip that's holding the column in down here to just about where this junction between hex and round takes place. And then we take the tubing on around and into the detector. So we have that entire distance as the <clears throat> injector to detector distance in a plumbing sense. Now, <clears throat> uh, how do we break it down? All right, let us do some greater detailed description here. I'll make it a little smaller still so we can see it. Okay. So now I have inserted colored arrows. And these help us break down what I was just talking about. So we have the red shows the beginning at the injector. And the second red shows the end at the detector. And along the way, we have one piece of peak tubing, one guard cartridge, and another piece of peak tubing in order to connect the column into the system so that we can do chromatography. Okay. Now, <clears throat> what is it that we really, really want to measure? Okay. And what did we actually measure when we measured the void time? So the red arrows show down here the volume due to the void time experiment, what we actually measured, all right? <clears throat> but that's not what we want, okay? What we want is from the beginning of the packing material to the end of the packing material, because that's where the separation takes place. So we need to, and the theory, the equation you're going to be using is going to look at the column. So we kind of need to understand how all this works and what should we 
you know, what, what can we expect and what should we get out of it? Okay, so first of all, let me um, show you what column in fittings look like. Okay. <clears throat> Columns from vendors have two kinds of end fittings, external and internal. But effectively, when you look at the cutaway drawing, they do the same thing. The idea is to have the liquid come in. And of course, there has to be a frit to hold the packing material into the column. Usually, the frits are made of porous stainless steel. So the liquid comes in shoots through a final little bore. There is this dispersion cone as a consequence of machining of the fitting. And the liquid spreads out, goes through the filter, and goes onto the column as a thin band. And that will be true for either kind of plumbing configuration, whether you either have the big block of metal on the column here and you screw in, or you have the big block of metal here and you just have the fitting go in. Effectively, uh, you have the same considerations. So we have, what we're trying to do here is create what is called a zero dead volume connection. So we have liquid always in contact. There's no entrained air or anything else that's going to interfere with our chromatography. We need a smooth, defined liquid flow system. So now you have some idea of how the vendors actually make hardware to do this. Okay, so now <clears throat> what I want to do is ask you a question. We measured the total distance, okay, if I go to this one again, okay, that would be from here down to here at the injector. We measured the total volume there from this point to this point. That's what we've measured. We do our theoretical calculation based on this column information, and the two numbers will not agree. So what are we going to do? to solve that problem, okay? And um, I'm, I wanna bounce some ideas off of you as to what we might do to solve the problem uh, as soon as I can get back to it there. <clears throat> so what would you guys do if you had to solve this problem? Okay. Part of the answer is in the picture that you're looking at. Does that help? Okay. Well, we're stuck with the real world as scientists that we work in. So what can we do? We can't actually come up with any way, there's just no physical way to connect the column with zero dead volume connections to the detector and the injector at the same time. They're just too far separated in space and there's no possible way to do it. But we have the total volume of the system. That's what we discussed in the previous slides. And in this one, we have the total volume of everything except the column. So you will see that what I did was take the column out. All right, and in re instead of the column, I put in this little guy right here, okay? This is called the zero dead volume union, okay? Now, <clears throat> what does it do for us? it connects the guard cartridge to the detector tubing. So now what we have is from the injector to the detector, just the pipes, no column, okay? Just the tubes and guard cartridge and, and everything else that's here, fittings, et cetera, but no column, all right? So can we measure this volume? Give me a guess, yes or no. Okay. 
Any brave soul? Yes. All right. Very good, Jaheim. Of course we can do that. All right. And um, so how are we going to do it? Okay, the question is a bit rhetorical, but what would we do? Okay, we used the instrument with the column to measure the void time in the first place. So why don't we use the instrument without the column to measure the volume of everything else? Okay, does that seem reasonable? Again, I need some comment. Mm -hmm. I lost you? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> I think you're trying to make it too hard. Okay. You have a system with a total volume, and it's got several components in it. If you take one of those components out and put the rest of it together, you have removed exactly the volume of the component that you removed. Okay. I mean, this is, you know, yeah. toys and Legos and putting things together. You take something out, you've got that much less of that one thing. Okay. So we had it all together and we measured the void time. We can do it again without the column. Okay. And what would we expect if we do that? we would expect to get a pretty small number because, and, and the number that we would expect to get is the difference between theory and experiment, right? Yes, I understand. Yeah, okay. So <clears throat> what would we choose to, remember we have to be able to see something so would we use the same system we were using before? The same system being the hydrogen peroxide? Yes. Yeah, that's right. Sure, because, I mean, you know, it's it's obvious. We've done the big experiment. Now we're going to do some little part, you know, part experiments along the way. So what happens if we do that? Okay, let's take a look. I am going to set up in my sample set method. Actually, this happens to be a general one I was using for development at the time. And I chose the line that's highlighted in black. So I am, I'm not using the same concentration used in the lab. I've just got a dilute solution of hydrogen peroxide in water. And I'm going to use one of the same methods that I used previously. So we're going to run it and we're going to see what we get. And this is what we get. Okay. And does that look sensible? Is that what you would expect? Have any of you guys had physics? Yes, with the physics. Okay. Did you did you talk about um, Newtonian flows in tubes and uh, liquids in in any way? Have you had any experience with that in your physics class? I don't believe so. Not at least not in depth. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, actually, we don't need much depth. Uh, really, what you just need to do is to just think about liquid moving through a pipe. Um, or, as I like to tell people, liquid moving through a soda straw. So, you know, you can kind of do some of these experiments the next time you drink something with a straw, at least qualitatively. So, <clears throat> what's our retention time here for the hydrogen peroxide? Two minutes, yeah, okay. And is that what we would expect? Does that make sense? Okay. First of all, did you note the discrepancy between theory and experiment?
I, I can appreciate that the answer is probably no, because you haven't done that yet, right? Anybody? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so what you'll find is that you, you the hydrogen peroxide void time that you measured is about 1.41 minutes. And when you do the calculation, you're going to get about 1.3. So <clears throat> does this make sense? Because From this- From 0.41 to 0.13? Isn't that no. all? From, from 1.41 minutes measured experimentally, you're going to find that the theoretical calculation will give you a number around 1.3 minutes. And the difference between 1.3 and 1.41 is the void time discrepancy. And what I'm showing you is that the discrepancy comes from the plumbing. And the discrepancy is consistent with the plumbing. Because if we take the column out and measure the plumbing, we get 0 0.112 minutes as the time necessary for a molecule of solvent to flow from the injector to the detector with no column present. Okay, <clears throat> I'm pushing this on you guys because I really, really want you to think about what's going on with this system. And it's not hard. You know, like I said, it's so does straw plumbing. If you see liquid move through a pipe uh, under pressure or under suction, it takes time for that liquid to travel a distance. And the same is true here. So you've got all the pieces and they all add up if you do the experiments properly. Okay, makes sense? Is, is anybody brave enough to tell me that they're completely lost at this point or is this just new material? It's just new material. So it's, it's okay. taking a minute to set in. Right. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm hoping to say again. I have a question. I just want to clarify this. So we have three components here right now. This graph is representing the tension on the dollar column present. We also have a second component. Jaheim, 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 slow down and a little louder. I'm an old guy. Louder. Okay. So there are, three, uh, there are three components because they have a difference. This graph is representing the difference, the retention time without the column present. We also have the retention time with the column present, which is 1.41 or 1.141. One of those numbers. But then it's one point. Other, it's, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Then we have another value that's slightly lower, which is where this difference comes in. What would you name that other value? You mean the one, this one, this one here? No, this is the difference between oh. having a column and not having a column. What was the third value? The one that is 1.131? 1. Okay, that's the, that's the calculated value. The uh -huh. 1.3 is the calculated value. That's what you get from the equation. It's, 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 um, we could call it the theoretical value, but <laughs> it's an empirical theoretical value. You know, it's not a pure derivation from um, all geometry and, and, and math. It makes some assumptions. The, the main assumption it makes is uniformity of particle size in the column. And if it, if that is exactly the case, then the theory is pretty good. But if there's discrepancy there, then that means that the so-called theory isn't as void time is kind of a theoretical number. It's, it's based on um, the particle sizes, uh, typical packing of particles, uh, very tiny particles in a column. There's a standard packing that you can expect geometrically. And therefore, you do all that, you get an estimated 
fill volume and empty volume in the column, and the empty volume is what's filled up with the liquid. So, uh, and you have to make assumptions to get those. It's it's called the ratio of stationary to mobile phase in the column. And it's it's beyond what we're gonna ever talk about in this course. I don't even talk about it with students in analytical. I, I mention it in analytical, but we don't talk about it in terms of anything that you need to know. So, um, <clears throat> Uh, did, did that help, Jaheim, or do we still need to talk about it some more? Well, that helped me. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. Now, here's another question. The peak label says vitamin C or hydrogen peroxide. The sample name says that I actually used hydrogen peroxide. So <clears throat> could we use vitamin C? Could we use anything? to measure this um, discrepancy time, okay? The volume of all the other plumbing. <clears throat> Anybody wanna make a guess on that? Would it be yes, because you were saying that- Yes, that's that right, we can use anything. Yeah, mm -hmm. because now, do you wanna go ahead and tell me why we can use anything? I was going to suggest possibly because you were saying that at time that it takes to pass through the column, that's always going to be consistent no matter what you're doing. Uh, okay. <clears throat> uh, what you said sounds true, but that's not answering the question. What, the, what we do use has to have a property. And that property is we have to be able to see it. Okay. Right? Does that make sense? So we have to use something that has UV absorbance. Okay. All right. So now then, but why can we use anything that has UV absorbance? because there's no column, so there's no retention. So the pipes don't change anything no matter what flows through them, okay? These are the kinds of, this is the kind of thinking that I'm trying to stimulate because you guys are gonna need to start thinking like this in order to you know, really visualize what's going on in, in the, in the process and it'll help you so much when you're doing your write-up, okay? So we can use vitamin C or hydrogen peroxide because they're not retained. There's no retention, it's just gonna flow through. All we're measuring is travel time. How long does it take a molecule that you do use to get from the injector to the detector? That is the, the what we're looking at here. So the first example I'm showing you is this hydrogen peroxide, but here I have used vitamin C, okay? And in this case, I have 0.1 minutes, okay? In this case, I got 0.112 minutes. Which one do you think is a better number? Or are they equivalent? And we're just looking at error. This will probably be better. Uh, okay. Uh, I, you're too far this away from the microphone. I can't. This current one's probably better. Zero point one. Why? Why zero, do you zero. think? Why do you think the vitamin C is better? Because of the exact value, I think it will correlate better. No, whoa, 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 whoa! What exact value? That it stops at the tenth place in terms of having extra values as opposed to one one two no 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 scientifically 0. 0.100 and 0. 0.112 have the same error they're from the same pda detector okay there is no inherently greater precision uh 
in these three numbers than there is in the 0. 0.112. We're actually looking at a 0, 1, 2 time difference. Is that real? Is what I'm asking you. Or is it preferable? Do we really think that the vitamin C gave us a better measure of the uh, <clears throat> the discrepancy time than the hydrogen peroxide did? All right, well, let me give you my opinion. And, I, and I, it really is an opinion. I can't absolutely say that this is exactly the way we want to do it. With the hydrogen peroxide, the absorbance is 0 0.0024. So we just have the smallest disturbance. Okay, We've got this little slug of hydrogen peroxide that was put in at the injector, and it's going to spread out as it flows through the pipe on the way to the detector. That's why we get a peak, okay? And this peak is not well-shaped because there's no chromatography. It's just Newtonian flow. So there's going to be mixing and it's, and it's going to disperse. But we don't have very much material in there. So it's all going to start at the beginning and then it's going to get to the detector at about the same time. But with the vitamin C, <clears throat> I've got an absorbance to 0.8, okay? So a lot of vitamin C is going through and it's also dispersing. So actually, because there's so much of it and it can begin to disperse more, my argument is that the higher concentration gives you a poorer number because the dispersion is high and you'll begin to see it come out too soon. Okay, now, in order to prove that, which I did not do in this experiment, I should probably make a one to 100 dilution on this vitamin C and inject it again. And I would expect to have an absorbance of about 0 0.008. And if I have a number that's about 0 0.112, then that will be a better number. Okay. Now, by going into this low dilution kind of stuff, I do appreciate that I am getting into physical chemistry. And, you know, this is a biochem class, and I most of you probably aren't even chem majors. So um, I don't need to, you know, I won't test you on this, and I won't, you know, pound on it over much. I just want to talk about some of these ideas so that you can kind of think about what's really happening in the physical process of, of setting up this instrument and doing these measurements. So that's what I'm, I'm trying to discuss here. And I realize that we're doing all of this at nine o'clock in the morning. And that's not necessarily the best time for anybody, but it's the time we have so we've got to try to make it work here. Okay, so um, any other comments, uh, questions at this point? Okay. Professor, I have a question. Okay. Um, would it be possible if we can go over the data that, that you sent? I think that would be most beneficial. Because a lot well, of that was, that's, that's the questions, you know. Um, uh, I can stop this and I come back to it later. But if you've got particular questions on your data, then fine, let's go for that. Okay. If this yeah, is like even if we're doing like, if we're doing like these examples you're going over, but with your data, I think that would definitely benefit all of us. Okay. But what, I'm doing right, what I'm doing right now is, is working on one part of the write-up that you're going to be uh, talking, you know, you're going to have to deal with. Um, so that's why I put this in. I mean, I didn't just pull this out of the air as an advanced discussion of uh, measurements on the HPLC. Uh, this is something you guys actually have to think about as part of what you're going to be writing up. Uh, but I'm more than willing to do stuff with, uh, with the, the data. Do you have something that you want to uh, talk about particularly, or did you want to go back? I mean, I can go back to last week's presentation and uh, go into my my data if that's what you want to look at. What would you like to do particularly? 
Um, I mean, I wouldn't mind going over like the analysis results because we have like five different folders that you sent us. Yes, right. But analysis is only in one of them. Yeah, no, no. But there's like 17 different like attachments in there. And well, if we, we quickly went through everything just to oh, talk about okay. it. All right. All right. Um, let me park this if I can. Okay, and then I need to go here and go back. Um, let me go down. Green Kings. Where is it? Let's see what we have here. No. Where did I put that? Here. Okay. All right, so I've picked my data folder. You can see my data folder? No. Okay, so then I need to change sharing. Where is that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're here. Could I just do one at a time? Maybe I can only do one at a time. Let me exit out of this one. Cancel. Why don't you just go away? Oh, what's the matter with you? Hmm. I can't get rid of that. Hmm. You might just have to press save. I don't think it's going to let you close it unless you save it. Okay. But I shouldn't even have to do any of that. I should just be able to get out. Yeah, no, hundred percent. It's weird. Oh wait, here, stop share. Okay, how about that? Then share again. Okay, now I want to go here. There, that's what we want. Now you can see my. Yep. Okay, very good. So let's make it bigger. All right. So now then, these are the five folders that you have. This happens to be my data. Okay. And the analysis results, if we go into analysis results, you have a bunch of chromatograms. Okay. You can't necessarily tell that just by looking here but if i choose one of them okay i'll choose this one there you are okay so that is my 40 ppm vitamin c and that's the individual chromatogram i think every time you would attempt to open one you might have to just unclick and reclick the share because now it's open up a new thing technically you mean you didn't see what I just did? Yeah, we don't see the 40 ppm. We just see the folder still. Oh. Okay.
Yes, we all right. You see this? You see my directory on the analysis results? Yeah, we see like the 15 folders or the PDS. No, you see you see files. Yeah, yeah, the files, yeah. Okay. All right. Now then, so you're telling me if I click on one of these, you don't see that? No. Interesting. This is going to be awfully inconvenient then if you want to review data and we have the screen sharing problem like this. Um, well, the other stuff you were showing us, wasn't that a, you know, downloaded like PDF also? So how are you? Yeah, but they were, all, they were all in one file. Okay. Now I'm going through things nested so i i brought up a directory and then if i bring up a file that's another screen is what it seems to be and it's not it's not working right whereas before i had all my pdfs in one folder and i opened that and we were just scrolling up and down in that folder i can't scroll up and down this list and show you what's here you know if i click on it i see the chromatogram but you guys don't see the chromatogram is what you're telling me, unless I stop the sharing, click on that and then go back and we, which I can do. Okay. So if I stop sharing and then share again, and then I, well, now then I can't do that just yet because I've got to choose something. So let me choose something. So we'll choose this one and that comes up. Now I will stop sharing, share again, and show you that chromatogram. Okay, there. Okay, so now you can see the chromatogram, right? Yes. But that's all, all that we can do. If I if I move to another file, you can't see that unless I go back and stop sharing. So what I'm saying is going up and down a directory structure folder is very difficult with Zoom because I have to stop sharing the screen for every one in order to talk about it. Shouldn't you? It should allow you to just share your entire screen, which should fits the problem. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, so your screen. Any idea where I would find that? Oh, here, maybe if I if I do this. When you click share screen, yeah, that should yeah, be. There it. you go, that should work. Try it now and we'll let you know. Okay. Well, can you see the directory? Yep. Okay. Okay. And can you see yeah, the we can see it. Perfect. Oh. All right, okay. <clears throat> and if anything too, if you want to make it easier for us to see also, you could just you know press the green button so it takes it to the full screen, but we will still be able to see it too. A green button. Ah, okay. That's kind of a dangerous thing to do on a Mac because then I'm stuck with full screen. And if I go to the to over here, it'll minimize it and put it gotcha. marked. Okay. So I tend not to do that. I tend to do this. Okay. I tend to do that. And then do this. That's fine. That works just as good. <laughs> Thank you. All right. <clears throat> All right. So now then this is the first one in the folder. So this is my low standard. Okay. So what you you guys need to realize this. Okay. I can't get the analysis, which has to be one method on the instrument or else it can't do the standardization because it has to have all the standard data in one place. I can't set up uh, 12 different files for the standards and then be able to, to produce anything for you. So because I can't do that, I can't give them individual names. The only names that they have are the result IDs. And you so you know 
from experience, I will tell you that you know from experience that you have 10, 20, 40, 60, 80, and 100 ppm. And then you have 10, 20, 40, 60, come on, Norm, 80, and 100 ppm. And then you have your juice, okay? So this is a result. That's your fruit juice, okay? Then we go to the next one, 2744. That is the juice and spike. Okay, so these are the individual chromatograms which you can always go back to and look at. But really in this folder, there's only two things that you really need to pay attention to to answer the questions. The juice and spike overlay, come on, wake up, okay here and the table that goes with it that shows you know the juice is 60 and the spike is 70 and it's consistent because it was 10.1 okay so this one is supposed to be 10.1 and it's 9.9 .9, and the other one is also 9.9 .9, okay and it's supposed to be 10.1 so you know it's not perfect but it shows what's supposed to happen and then the overlay shows what the individual chromatograms look like and that the spike is higher. And that's what you would expect. And you can see from the legend down here, which color goes with which chromatogram. Okay, does this help? Is this what you're after? 100%, yes, 100%. Okay, all right, but you know, I mean, this is what I'm more or less assuming that you're ready to do, um, you know, because I've given you data, you look at data. It's, it's that kind of thing. Anyway, so now then what's the next one? The next one is the calibration report. Okay, there's your standards. Okay, and then here's the table for the standards. Okay, so, um, do I need to tell you more? I mean, are we on the right track here? Um, yeah, can you just kind of reiterate what the standards do again for this for the table for this one? All right. First of all, background. <clears throat> I'm working on the assumption that from Gen Kim or somewhere in life, you guys have already had a standardization analysis. Is that, is that wrong thinking on my part? You know, um, a standardization analysis is where you make up solutions of known concentrations and measure them on an instrument and to get numbers. And then you make the plot of the response versus concentration. And then you use that plot to analyze unknowns. Haven't you done this before? I mean, if you haven't, just tell me because this completely changes the picture. Um, I Gen Chem was a while ago, but I don't necessarily recall doing that. Okay, and 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 so, but you you come into biochem and you've never done a standardization analysis. Is that the, is that the the message I need to get here? If we did it, was a long time ago for us, for most of us. <laughs> You guys don't know what a long time ago is. <laughs> uh, three, two to three years ago. Right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> a long time ago. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. All right. Then <clears throat> I'll go back a bit uh, to what we might call some, some first principles. <clears throat> We are beginning chemists, we are young chemists, and we have some kind of an instrument in front of us. Most commonly, it's a small spectrophotometer. And what you would do is you would say, okay, I have an unknown solution and I would like to know how much of some component is in it. We can even assume that 
in this experiment that you did in GenChem that you were analyzing vitamin C. And so you will make up a series of standards then, and you will have a lab that tells you what concentrations to make because the unknowns that you're going to be given will be in that concentration range. And we are, in a sense, doing the same thing here. I have given you a range of standards that you have to prepare because I know from experience the quantity of vitamin C that you're likely to encounter in juices. And so you bring in your unknown juices and we are going to analyze the vitamin C in that juice. So what we want to do is establish some response that we can measure chemically uh, that we can get on this juice. And with the juice, uh, granted, it's going to be a problem because your juices are colored. Um, so it's not maybe vitamin C is not a good example to pick. Uh, but let's say that you have a colorless juice and um, you're going to go into the lab and dilute that juice and take a reading on your instrument. But that reading is just a UV response. That doesn't tell you how much material you have. To know how much material you have, you have to have standards that you can compare it against. So you make up those standards and you read them and you get all of their absorbances. In this case, we made up six standards and read them. And I got the absorbances that you see on this plot, but they're not absorbances that we routinely think about. They are uh, heights or areas, um, but that's okay. We'll live with that. So we have the heights or the areas. And in this case, it's the areas. So we, we have a 10 ppm and it gives us a response of 315392. And then we have a 20 ppm, and it gives us a response of 695537, okay? And so on up the line. When we do 40, we get 1472237 for the first time that we do it for this point, okay? And <clears throat> we keep on going, and then somewhere in here, we're going to get our juice number, and we're going to see that it falls in between a response somewhere so that we know that the concentration is between the numbers over here. So if the standard, if, or sorry, if the juice reads, say, 167198, okay, then we know it's going to be between 40 and 60. Okay. And so we go to the curve over here and we choose that number, that area, from what's shown, and it will be one, six, seven, it'll be over here somewhere, it'll come over here. And then we go down, we try to go straight down, which I'm not very good at. And we come to the axis and we see what the concentration is. So in principle, you can read it off the plot and that's called interpolating. Um, I hope that word rings a bell. Um, but anyway, that's what we are trying to do here. So we're going to, you know, have this analysis set up. And normally, when you did this before, you got all these numbers, and then you had to go off and go into Excel, or use your programmable calculator, or something like that, and do the least squares fit or draw the line, etc. Well, you don't have to do all that here. All you have to do here is just work with the data that I'm giving you from the instrument, because this is the way that it's done in the modern world. Computers take the drudge work away from you guys so that you can just think about what your experiment means. And that's kind of the goal that I'm after in, in what I'm doing here. Okay, now, has what I've said so far helped? Or do we need to do more? Yeah, that's definitely help. Um, the result ID doesn't matter, right? That's just like a more or less like a title per se, or or does it matter? 
the result you mean the result id in the last column oh okay <clears throat> the result id is an instrument clerical number and i try to put them in tables so that if you come back to me and say you want to see something with a particular chromatogram or in a particular area, if I know the result ID, I can go much more quickly to your data in the instrument and get that information. So I record result IDs for that reason. Now, that being said, let's go back to the table, okay? And what you see here is that the 2731 shows up in the name, okay? So we know that 2731 is the 10 PPM. Gotcha. Okay? Yeah. All right. And then 2732 is 20 PPM. Right. So it goes through 31, 32, 33, down, okay, 36. And then it goes back up because remember, we injected the standard series once and then we injected it again. So the second trial is 2737. And then 8, 9, 40, 41. Okay, and that is what you see in the table over here. Okay, and then the juice and spike, they don't show up in the standard table because they're samples. Got it. Yes, no. Yeah, I think you froze for a second. I was like, I said, got it. We understand. Oh, okay. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. So now then that takes care of the analysis folder. Yes. Okay. So if I go here, well, let's just get out of this one and then go back. All right. Now, <clears throat> information chromatograms. <clears throat> Do you know what's going on here? Probably the answer is no, correct? All right, so then <clears throat> what can we do to Let's see, did I park that or did I get out of it all together? I think there's something in here. No, that's just Zoom. I don't need that. Let me go away. All right. Well, let's work by analogy to what we did in the um, analysis folder. <clears throat> here, the files all begin with numbers because in this case, I can relate the data to where it is in your original experiment outline, okay? And when you're thinking about the results of an experiment, it's always a good idea to always keep in mind your original experimental outline. What was it you were trying to do? So the, the sample set table outlines the experiment for you. You went through and you made all these vials and you put them into the instrument in a particular order to do a particular series of measurements to get information. And the files here are that information. So the first one, which is line two of your table, is the void time. And we can see the void time. So here's the information for the void time. Okay, <clears throat> then you injected your two blanks. Well, actually, yes, but you got three chromatograms. You got the eluent blank at 240, and you got the eluent blank at 210. 
Come on, wake up. There we are. Okay. <clears throat> so now you have your two blanks. And you need to look at those and see if they make sense and if it's the kind of result you would expect. And we had talked about that before, that actually the blanks look pretty good. Okay. Now the sugar... We want to know whether the sugar has any influence on the system, okay? And what do we see? We see that indeed it does have influence on the system. We get a peak here and we get a disturbance here. They're not very big, you know, in terms compared to a big vitamin C peak, it's going to be a flat baseline. But there is this tiny response. And so the sugar disturbs here. And then you get the other refractive index bend on the other side as this material rolls through the detector. <laughs> okay, but what we really need to know is that we don't have anything to worry about in the blank because out here where vitamin C is, it's flat and clean. There's nothing showing up there. Okay. All right. Now, I'm I'm seem to be. I just charged this guy, but I might need to swap mice if I don't get things better here. <laughs> so now we have the vitamin C and eluent, and this is the most important chromatogram. This is the one you have to get right because this is the one that's going to be used to compare everything else against, and it's um, roughly the middle standard. And you want to see that you've got good absorbance, good peak shape, the proper spectrum. Everything is reasonable for this compound because of this injection, because it's going to be used for comparing so many of the other injections to see what the effects are. Okay, so now we've got three chromatograms from that injection. We've got 240, 210, and 243, somewhere. I don't know which is which, but these three are going to be those wavelengths. Then we're going to have the vitamin C in sugar. And that's also at two wavelengths, 240 and 210. Let's take a look. I think this one will be 210. Yep. Okay. So what do we see? We see the sugar with vitamin C, and we see that stuff we saw in the blank. So the sugar does influence the chromatogram, but not where we care about it. Okay, so I put vitamin C with sugar for this processing method, just to remind you that it is um, with the, the sugar has been added to a standard. Okay. And then of course we see that the vitamin C response is much smaller because we are at 210 and at 210, 210 is over here. The vitamin C response at 210 is much, much lower than it is at 243. Okay. All right. So what's the last thing that we have? Okay, okay. the last thing is the juices. We have the juice at 210 and the juice at 240. I think this will probably be 210. Yeah, this is 210. Okay, so I use the, my data for the juice is terrible because, well, terrible in the sense that it's not interesting because I made a synthetic juice. So I don't really have any good stuff in my juice. Um, so I just see a little bit of noise peaks, et cetera, along the way. Um, but I wasn't out to have a, you know, a proper juice because it was my intention to give you, you guys your juice solutions, which worked. And then I even processed your juice uh, peaks with my standard so that you would have analysis results that you could report because you're gonna have to do the calculations on your juice and then you're kind of going to have to explain things to me. Does it make sense? Is this um, the kind of thing that you would expect in the real world? Uh, or the kind of behavior that you might expect from the vendor? So those are the sorts of things that I want to engage you with. Okay. And I know there's a lot of data. 
but there would have been quite a bit of data if you'd had to do it the old fashioned way. And then you wouldn't have gotten to do the interesting stuff because you would have just been busy doing the drudge work. And, and like I keep saying, the computer is going to take that drudge work away from you. But the, the, uh, the cost of that is that you have to be really, really involved with what's going on with the experiment so that you can understand your data and can write about it knowledgeably. Okay. Now, do I need to say anything else about the information chromatograms? Do you still have questions? Uh, no, not about the guy. I just have a quick question about like something you just said. You're so you're saying you're, the juice you used for your experiment was a synthetic juice and not a real, quote, not quote, a real juice. juice. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But we're still going to use that for no. You're going to use your juice, which is why I gave you your juice. So when you look at your analysis results, you're going to have your juice and my standards. So we're basing the data off of your data, but the yeah. juice we're using is our juice? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you, <laughs> I, I want to use as much of your data as I possibly can, but um, the standardizations were not generally uh, very good. Uh, there's only two that were kind of in the Yeah, board. that's what I'm confused about because you're saying to use our data, but our data wasn't good. But then you're saying not to use your data. I'm okay. Don't you you use my standards and your juice, and I gave you your juice results based on my standards in the email files I sent to you. So what I'm looking at here with Team Seven is my run on November third. Okay. And it's a little bit idealized and it's got just the basic files in it. Your folders will have extra. Okay. So your re an analysis result will have your juice result from your effort, but it will also have my juice result from your, from your juice, you know, it's in there. So, uh, okay. Let me prove that to you. I'm going to, this mouse is annoying. So we'll go back. Let's pick. You want to tell me who your team is and we'll use your real data? Do you know who you are? That was team one. Team one. Okay. Okay. Analysis results for team one. Okay. So then um, there is your standardization is here but this overlay this added in folder i put there on november 5th okay and that is your juice and juice and spike result okay all right so that's your juice analysis and your spike analysis all right and i can see right away that you screwed up the spike Okay, because the spike has to be bigger than the juice. And it's smaller. And I got a pretty good idea what you did. Mm -hmm. You didn't go back to the original juice. You took your diluted juice and you spiked it. So it's too small. So you've got the something like the original was 38 and a one to 10 on that would be about four. And if you add 10 and four, you get 14 and we got 17. And there's usually quite a bit of error in these things. So I'm not surprised, but I'm pretty sure that's what you did. But nevertheless, you've got the numbers, okay? So you've got the 38 milligrams per liter is the vitamin C concentration in the juice that you brought to lab. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. And I didn't give you all the individual chromatograms from my 
standardization. I think I did give you my data. I think everybody got my data as well. I didn't blend it into your folders, but what I did blend into your folders was your actual juice analysis. Mm -hmm. So everybody will have, and you can tell, there's two ways you can tell. First of all, since I pr produced it manually, uh, the word overlay is probably in the title. Uh, the uh, information I gave the instrument for the automatic file naming doesn't do that. So overlay says that I probably did it, but the, the real clue is that it's from the November 5th processing. So, you know, when I was getting your data together, I put my stuff there. And then, then just before I emailed you guys all this stuff, I built these directories and then sent it to you. Okay. So um, next question. So basically no matter what, just still use our data, correct? Yeah, use your use your data everywhere you can, okay? And the main place that you can use that is here with the juice analysis. But the other data that you can use that's yours is your blanks and your void time. Everybody's got a pretty good um, blank and void time, so you can use that for your discussions. Uh, but if you have a problem, you can check mine because you have my data too in Team 7. Okay, so I mean, this is this lab is about data organization. Okay, and that's the kind of stuff you come up with in the real world. And and I I will tell you that working through this lab will help you with your senior project because when you get to that point, you're going to be creating your own data, and you're going to have to organize it, and you're going to have to make sense of it. So what you're going to have in that case is you're going to have the experiments that you did and you're going to have all your data results and you got to look through all that and make sense of it. And that's what I'm giving you a beginning practice run doing here. You get a lot of data, you look through it, make sense of it, write it up. Would you have like a possible example, even if you use like my data, I don't care, of like an example of like where we should not use our data and use yours? Because like I wouldn't want to like waste my time and use my data when I should have been like using yours for something. You know what I mean? Don't use your data here. Okay. Do not use this table. Do not use this plot because this is your original standardization. Okay. So it's, it's not gonna give you anything that's helpful. Okay. So what does your juice and spike look like? Odd. Okay. Crazy numbers. Impossible. Okay, so uh, I think we've pretty well covered it. I mean, you can use your juice for juice and spike information just to as as um, as discussion points. You know, particularly when you're looking at the two ten nanometer um, juice for discussing the extra peaks. You know what else is in there because that's all qualitative. But use my results for anything that's quantitative. So when you're talking about your juice results, go here. When you're talking about your spike results, go here. And all of these are in the write-up. There's different questions, have different sections covering all of this stuff. Have you looked at the write-up yet? Me personally? Yeah, yeah, I have. 
Okay. All right. So you got an idea of what the questions are and yeah, and like what questions you need for specific graphs or whatever is yeah, hundred percent. So yeah, so it's your juice, your spike, my standards, um, my information chromatograms, if your information chromatogram is bad, okay? That is, it doesn't seem to have any response at all, okay? Um, and, and then you'll probably also need my data for the parameter changes, because you'll want to be consistent. You'll want to make sure that you're comparing the parameter change with a good one with another good one that's exactly the you run under the same conditions on the same day. So that would be another good place to use my data, but you can use your data, void time, the blanks, both of them, um, plain eluent and sugar. And um, if, your, if your middle vitamin C standard has some kind of a response, you can probably use your data even for the parameter changes. But take a look at your parameter change data and then take a look at mine. And if yours don't kind of match that philosophically, if they don't look like they're similar, then you better use mine. Okay, so that's that's the best course of action you recommend. Just right. kind of and, look and, at both. And, it's a big and difference. Here's, okay. And here's plan B. Plan B is when uncertain, ask me. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, specifically, when you get there and you're working on that particular one question, you know, then drop by the lab or send me an email or something like that. And we'll 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 work with, you know, this right down to the result IDs on those files if necessary to to get you on the right track. OK. OK. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, do we want to keep going here? Let's see if I go back. <clears throat> okay, overlays. <clears throat> the overlays allow you to do quick comparisons. Okay, so you really, really want to um, make sure that you've got decent data. For the reproducibility, you might want to use mine, okay? I'm not sure how each individual group looks. I didn't go through it in that kind of detail, but the reproducibility overlay is, is probably the hardest one that you have to deal with. So let's see what team one's reproducibility looks like. Not good, we just have one, okay? So that's not gonna be helpful. So let's go to back, come on back, back again. Choose me, overlays, reproducibility should be in here someplace, there it is. Okay, all right, <clears throat> so. Here, what's, the, what's important is the table, and what's important in the table is the retention times. And the instrument, you can see every peak trial has a vitamin C, and so they're jiggling a little bit. They're not right on top of each other. So reproducibility was not as good this year with the instrument as I was expecting, but it's good enough for the lab that we have to do. So what are we checking? A concept that I want to introduce you guys to is we're making changes. We're changing parameters and we see an effect. But the question we have to ask ourselves is, is that effect significant? You know, and by that, I mean, is it a real change or is it just within the error window? Okay. So I am, you know, dragging you into all of this analytical stuff because we're doing an analysis and it's important. So we want to know um, if the instrument is behaving well with respect to injection time. And in order to make that measurement, we have to make more than one injection. And I did not systematically build into the experiment uh, scattered injection trials to do that. 
But as a consequence of doing all the other things that you had to do, you end up with four injections that were run under the same instrument conditions. The same instrument conditions means the same flow rate, the same sampling rate, the same eluent composition, the same column temperature, uh, the same sampling rate. So we have all these injection possibilities. We want to make sure that it all is reproducing. And there are four injections you made that are the same in that sense. <clears throat> the two standards uh, for analysis and the two information uh, injections, one of them being the original vitamin C and eluent, and the second one being the wavelength change. So all four of these are at 240, Okay, or it doesn't say it here, but it is. Um, and then we have the retention times. And then we have the average retention time calculated for you and the standard deviation. Okay, now the standard deviation is not the error. Okay, <clears throat> it's the hard part of the error measurement that you have to make. But last week when we talked, I gave you this table from um, the text that we used for the analytical course. And it tells you that whenever you have a value, in this case, 2.696, there's a plus minus associated with that value. And the plus minus is calculated by using the student T factor times the standard deviation divided by the square root of the number of trials. Okay, and so from that table, you'll get the number, and I'm doing all this in my head, okay, because I know this, so I, I'm not showing you anything right now, but you'll look in that table, and you'll find a 95% confidence T number, and you put that into the expression, and then you've got your standard deviation, which is here, the 0 0.0019, and you've got your number of trials, which is four, and you can take the square root of four, pretty easy. So then once you calculated that, you have the value that is plus minus. So it's going to be 2.696 plus or minus a little bit more than 0 0.0019 because it's going to be about one and a half times this number, probably about plus or minus 0 0.0028, something like that. So now we have a pretty good idea that the instrument is is going to have a retention time that's plus or minus about three <clears throat> um, thousandths of a minute, which is really good because three thousandths of a minute is not very much time. Okay. Does that help? Do we need to go through it again? or expand on some parts of it. That helps. Okay. All right. Now, I think the last, I don't even have to bring it forward. Okay, go back. The last one is, oh, well, no, the parameter changes here, okay? So <clears throat> the parameter changes, we have the wavelength change. This is on one injection, the two different wavelengths, and then we have a sample rate change and a flow rate change and the eluent composition change, which didn't work, okay, for anybody, and including me, because there was an instrument issue, which I've been working on this past week. And I think I know what to do so it doesn't happen again, but we can't do anything to fix our data for this year. So what I did was I gave you guys data from uh, last year, uh, from somebody who had a good result on this from last year. Okay. <clears throat> and, um, then I happen to have, this really shouldn't be here, but that's okay. 
the, the template doesn't belong here, but that's where it ended up in this case. So now if I go back, the last one is the tables. And uh, the tables have the analysis instrument method. And this is the one that you need the most. Okay. Um, it's got, it looks like this. Okay, it's got several pages and you're going to use it to answer some questions um, <clears throat> at the beginning of the write-up. Okay. And I haven't gone over a lot of this, I haven't gone over any of it actually. But what I found is that you guys tend to be pretty good at once you really get into it, uh, you tend to be pretty good at picking out the information that answers the questions that I've asked. But, you know, you'll look through here and try to find the parameter that I've asked about. This is an important one. It's called the gradient table, but it it is not always a gradient because we're running isocratically. So this shows our isocratic conditions, 0.8 mils a minute. 100% mobile phase A. And then here's our column information. So you've got that, and that'll be key stuff that you have to answer. And then there's other things along here where you'll get numbers out to answer the question. Um, so I think, you know, when you get into that, you can deal with it. If you have any questions, then you can get back to me then. Okay, and then I want to go um, here. And then the channels table and the results table. I put in my results table. Um, and in this case, my channels table, because it's my data. But for each of you guys, I think you do have your own channels table because your data, your actual data acquisition can be yours. There's nothing that can be screwed up there. But for the results table, I've given you mine. And these tables aren't even critical that you have them. I'm giving them to you because I think it helps you see the big picture of what you're trying to do. Or you can look at them and say, okay, I need such and so from somewhere because I see the result ID or I see this, or it just helps you see everything that came together to make this experiment work for you. So all this stuff was kind of out there. Some of it was in the real world, some of it's in the instrument, uh, but the instrument has organized the experiment for you. All right, so now we've gone through the directory. Is there anything else that you want to ask about? Do you want to continue with my earlier presentation? Um, do you want to quit? Do you have a, any idea uh, as to what we should do next year? I can go on and finish my presentation or I can keep asking or answering questions. Remember, this is your time, you know, this is, this is what we're trying to do to get you guys into the write-up process. I just want to say thank you for going over that. It definitely helped me personally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> See, I was just working on the assumption I don't necessarily have the best background on on what your background is. Uh, so I was assuming that you were at least familiar with the uh, basics of a, of a standard analysis. Um, I, I kind of think that's pretty fundamental. And if you're in a 4,000 level course, I would assume that you would have seen that before. In fact, I would even assume that you've been doing it in your earlier labs I mean, this year, this semester, before you even got to 
uh, the chromatography lab? Didn't you have to do it in the LDH lab or, or the other one that you were doing earlier on? Isn't there any standard information in there? I don't know those labs, so I'm not sure, but. Okay. All right, is there a proposal as to what we should do next? Should I continue? Are you going to ask questions? Um, is there more specific stuff you'd like to have reviewed? I need some I need some feedback. Mm -hmm. The thing about electronics. I'm is, very satisfied personally. Uh, when you've gone over, I have a plan now to tackle my lab report and I plan to do that. That's just me. If you want some sort of opinion, that's my own. Okay. That I provide it to you. Uh that it's Jaheem talking. Yeah, yes, yes. Okay. Speak. All right. I just turned my speaker up. You are so faint. I can't hear you very well. So would you say uh, again? Is. Okay. Would you I, say? Mm -hmm. I'm saying, saying that what I've gotten today from you, I feel oh. confident at this point in time that I'm able to tackle my lab report. So oh, okay. for me, I'm quite satisfied. That's just my opinion. Okay. All right. Question. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. So what about the rest of you? Do you want to continue or do you want to stop? Uh, just, I have a quick, uh, one more quick question. Uh -huh. uh, do you have the lab report by chance, like download already, like you can pull it up? No, I don't. Um, uh, what tell me what you want to know? Uh, maybe I can do it in my head. Oh, it was more like, like kind of like a, a visual thing. It'll be too oh. much, yeah. Okay, well, what do you want the visual of in, in the and I wanted the actual report like page 15 through 17. Those questions were based upon the vitamin C sample set three template. That was just my kind of question. I know you're not gonna know the top of your head. Okay. All right. So that's um, that's the sample set method table, and you are. What are you asked to do there? Uh, there's just a bunch of questions. I just there's like probably like twenty plus questions on. It. I just wanted to make sure those questions were based upon that. Because it kind of like follows right after that. I just want. Yeah, to... it's a big table, and then you have to do matching. You have to pick out the sections uh, because I want you to think about these tables and understand what they mean. And you can you can do this because usually the the groups do pretty well on this question. This is not a hard question. But are you telling me it's hard for you? No, no I just wanted to make sure we were, we were using that table for the matching and then for the yes, the yes, yes, yeah. And I just left it with the earlier version because the newer version is even longer with all the automatic stuff that I've put in, and I didn't want to mess around with it too much. It doesn't. It doesn't fundamentally change anything. It's the, the ideas are still the same. You're just working with an older, shorter version that doesn't have all the automatic reporting instructions in it. Well, is are there more questions? Is there a consensus to quit? Is there a consensus to continue with my presentation? What would you guys like to do? Um, over 
break, would you respond to an email or no? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just want to make sure, you know. Yeah. I don't want to bother you if you're enjoying your food. I have a, I have a question. Do you... Now, uh, when I say that, I might not respond Thursday, Friday, Saturday morning kind of thing, but by the, you know, um, up through Tuesday night and then beginning Saturday night, Sunday of that weekend, I will definitely be back to respond. All right. Yeah. Do you um think that we missed anything important on your presentation? Because I wouldn't want to move on. I, if was sim I was simply going through stuff that I thought would be helpful. I, I guess we didn't even quite finish the um, 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 yeah, we didn't even finish everything I was talking about on this void time stuff. But, you know, if you've got the basic idea, we don't have to continue. I just wanted to drag you through these things from my point of view as a, as a kind of review so that you would keep seeing the instrument doing stuff, but maybe slightly different stuff. So you get a little bit better feel as to how flexible it was and kind of expand your thinking on the topics a little bit. That's what I was pushing for. There's nothing I have that I thought was critical. It was either review or what I thought was interesting. We've really reached the point where it's down to you guys thinking about it and asking questions. All right. It looks like a lot of people have left. Is that the case? I just see five of us, six of us left here. No, that's not the case. That's not the case? Okay. So I just can't see everybody that's here somehow. Well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> that's... So are there more questions, guys? I'm all set. Okay. I'll definitely be visiting your office hours or emailing you with, with any further questions, but today has been very helpful. Thank you. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. If you can, stop by the lab because then you can see the instrument. One of the things I regret is that we just don't have enough time to get you guys on it more it would be better if we could do that but it's also a very time consuming process so it's not not practical at this point it's better to run it like a contract lab than to run it like a hands-on lab So are we closing up shop? I think so. And I guess everyone will stop by or send you an email if we have any okay. further questions. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, thanks guys. It was it was interesting. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate your participation. Have a good one. Thank you. Okay. 